Oh, hey, didn't see you there. Happy you could join me. Uh, welcome. I, I wasn't, wasn't, wasn't expecting you so soon. Uh, okay, enough jokes. Uh, welcome back. We are uh, on the third day of the coronavirus. Uh, I don't even know what this is called. Is this an outbreak? Is this a pandemic? Is this just simply a reason to stay home? I don't think it's that, but uh, I don't know what it is. We're on the third day of the coronavirus though, and we'll say that. So uh, I'm keeping track as you know. So there we go, through day three. Uh, today, our goal is to wrap up the uh, the rest of chapter 36 uh, with some notes. Uh, so hopefully you have those from yesterday. Uh, hopefully you found my video okay. Uh, I know that some of the other people were having issues with uh, accessing it, I believe. Uh, I believe there was like a filter thing. Uh, I blame it on uh, I blame it on YouTube trying to silence me uh, and, and stop me from spreading my my information uh, during this this time but uh, never fear, I'm still here. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm here. Uh, I will not be silenced. I will not go anywhere. I will still be here. Uh, we can't go anywhere because we're under quarantine. So there. Uh, the goal for today, like I said, is to finish up the chapter 36. Uh, you have the notes from yesterday, hopefully. Uh, hopefully you've still got those out. Uh, hopefully everything made sense. Again, if it did not, uh, email me and uh, I can hopefully answer your questions. Um, like I said, we're going to go through. Uh, we left off yesterday at the uh, end of that Cold War beginnings heading. Uh, we talked about NATO, uh, talked about how, uh, how the United States kind of takes a leadership role in the world after this uh, World War II uh, is over. Um, so that's, that's a noteworthy thing for us. Um, where we are picking up here is uh, talking about trouble in Asia. Uh, this gentleman here uh, is our first guy that we got to talk about. His name is Douglas MacArthur. Uh, Douglas MacArthur, and he is, I believe, on that uh, notes sheet that you have. So Douglas MacArthur is uh, general at this point uh, in the United States. Uh, he is a naval general. Um, he was actually in the army, but he's, uh, or I don't actually know what he was in. Um, that should be easily found if you wanted to look that up, though. Uh, but he is uh, active in World War II. Uh, he is the leader of the war in the Pacific on the American side. Uh, so he is uh, kind of responsible for leading us through uh, our island hopping campaign, uh, gathering up those uh, territories in the Pacific Ocean and leading us to the point where we end up dropping the atomic bombs. So Douglas MacArthur is given control at this point of, uh, given control at this point of figuring out what to do with Japan. Uh, we talked about what to do with uh, Germany and break it up into some different groups, different uh, spheres of influence. Uh, Japan, though, uh, we in America were really the only ones who were uh, actively fighting the Japanese in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, I guess the Russians were in some cases, but it was mostly us. So we're the ones who kind of get the responsibility to uh, set them up for success in the future. So MacArthur ends up uh, organizing a uh, constitution for Japan uh, in 1946, the year after the war is over. Uh, it, it gets rid of a lot of the things that we viewed as negative that Japan was doing. Uh, for instance, militarism, uh, expanding their military frequently, uh, as well as their style of government, where the, you end up with an emperor, and uh, it just wasn't what we were really comfortable with. So we end up implementing a Western-style democracy uh, into that uh, into that country uh, under the supervision of Douglas MacArthur. So uh, we will talk more about Douglas MacArthur uh, at the end of the lesson today. Now, another issue with Asia is uh, China. Uh, China, shortly after, uh, shortly after the world or the Second World War ends, China's not really been involved in the war at all. Um, they were brought in a little bit by Japan, but uh, not really involved in fighting in it. Uh, China was facing uh, a lot of question marks about which direction they were going to go. Were they going to be communist? Were they going to be uh, democratic? Uh, there was uh, obviously Mao Zedong uh, is, is the communist leader there. 
Uh, but uh, in 1949, the nationalists, the communist opposition, uh, or the opposition to the communists, uh, the nationalists here uh, in China end up uh, being defeated. Uh, and finally, China ends up falling to communism once and for all. So China, China falling to communism, that was, uh, I think I mentioned on the notes, yeah, one, one fourth of the world's population had just become communist. So if we are trying to contain communism and stop the spread of communism, uh, we are not doing that great of a job if a quarter of the world just turned communist uh, overnight, essentially, uh, or affirmed themselves as communist. So that is a depressing thing for America. It feels like it's a big deal. Uh, it is a big deal. So communism is still, I guess, technically in China today. Uh, they have implemented some areas of capitalism in China, but it is, uh, I guess, still technically or still technically communism or communist today. Now let's talk about the arms race, uh, the nuclear arms race. Uh, when we dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we were the only ones in the world to have the atomic bombs. Uh, we got that capability during the middle of the uh, Second World War under the Manhattan Project, and we had it and nobody else could. Uh, the problem is, uh, is that words started traveling around and uh, people started, uh, people started passing information around against our will. Uh, and the Soviets ended up getting a hold of uh, information on how to uh, make atomic bombs and uh, jumped ahead and was able to, the Soviet Union ended up creating their first atomic bomb in uh, late 1949, in September of 1949. Uh, we had in America projected that they would get the atomic bomb in like 1952, uh, 1953. So they were like four years ahead, three years ahead of where we thought they were going to be. Um, Harry Truman, the president at the time, uh, ends up ordering the development of an even more powerful bomb uh, called the hydrogen bomb. Uh, and the hydrogen bomb, our first hydrogen bomb was exploded uh, in the Marshall Islands in uh, 1952. Um, I have a picture of that uh, somewhere here. <clears throat> so 1952, uh, that is a picture of the first, uh, the first explosion. Uh, this bomb was called Ivy Mike, Ivy Mike, like Ivy as in like I-V-E-Y. Um, so Ivy Mike there, uh, people describe that cloud not as a mushroom cloud, but as like a cauliflower cloud. Uh, and, and word has it that this bomb was uh, 500 times more powerful than uh, either of the two bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, 10,000, I think it was 10,000. Yeah, 10,000. I think I looked that up correctly. Uh, 10,000 kilotons of TNT was the equivalent of this atomic bomb or this hydrogen bomb. So uh, just massive, massive amount of power in this thing. Now, so we said, oh, well, we're ahead of the Soviets uh, because now we've got an atomic or we've got a hydrogen bomb and they're sitting there with with their puny little uh, atomic bombs. Uh, we uh, ended up finding out that the Soviets ended up uh, dropping or exploding their first hydrogen bomb uh, one year after we did uh, in 1953. So uh, essentially at that point, we're neck and neck and we're even with each other. And uh, it's any person's game at this point who is going to win this arms race. So the nuclear arms race is kind of the, the point there, but uh, it is um, just... I don't know. It's a, it's a big deal for us. We want to obviously win, but we also obviously don't want to die. So uh, it's, it's a, a difficult time for us as we're trying to deal with that. Now, next up, communists at home, dealing with communists at home. Uh, in 1938, okay, during the middle of this uh, buildup towards World War II, uh, America is worried that we are going to give information away to uh, people who are bad people, uh, people who are going against the United States. So we end up creating a committee that I have listed on your notes sheet called the House Un-American Activities Committee, uh, HUAC, is what it's often referred to as, HUAC. So HUAC uh, is designed to investigate, uh, as I wrote on my notes, subversion which just means kind of opposition to the government. So subversion, that's what they're doing. They're trying to investigate anybody who is opposing the government in any large way. 
So uh, some examples of this happening. Uh, here's oh, So here's a picture of HUAC, uh, a meeting in HUAC. Um, and this was after the war, I believe. Uh, this guy pictured here is another guy that was on uh, the notes. His name is Alger Hiss. Alger Hiss. Uh, Alger Hiss was a uh, New Deal Democrat. He was a guy who was one of FDR's, uh, one of FDR's people, uh, supporter of FDR, uh, working in FDR's uh, New Deal administration. Uh, but he ends up getting accused in uh, 1948 uh, by a future president. Uh, his name is Richard Nixon, uh, getting accused. At that point, he's just a con congressman, Richard Nixon is. Uh, accuses Alger Hiss of, uh, of subversion under this HUAC. So uh, what ends up happening, he ends up being convicted, ends up serving in prison. Um, Americans are kind of jumping in and now uh, starting to look for people who are uh, communist spies, right? So uh, this is this is hopefully ringing bells for you from your understanding of the crucible. Uh, we will get into that more, uh, not in this unit, but in uh, next chapter, uh, or not in this chapter, but next chapter, uh, when we talk about McCarthyism, uh, Justin McCarthy, uh, and the product, or the product of that is uh, what what Alfred Miller writes the Crucible out of uh, is that time period. So Alger Hiss is kind of uh, involved in that as well. These other two people here are also on your sheet called the Rosenbergs, uh, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Uh, they were convicted in 1951. Uh, they were uh, officials that were working on uh, atomic bomb stuff uh, in, I guess, New Mexico. Um, <clears throat> so they were working on the atomic bombs and helping develop them. Uh, but what ends up happening here is they get convicted, uh, accused of selling those secrets uh, and stealing them to, or stealing them and selling them to the Soviet Union. Uh, and we thought that the, the Rosenbergs were part of the reason why the Soviets caught up to us so fast. So uh, the Rosenbergs end up getting uh, sentenced to death. Uh, they are the only two people in American history to be sentenced to death for espionage. Um, we have never done that and haven't done that since. Uh, but the Rosenbergs here end up getting uh, getting killed, uh, I believe electric chair, um, due to this, uh, due to their accused espionage. Uh, side note, I happen to think that, and nobody can steal this on me, I happen to think if I ever start like an indie band, one of those ones that's like really cool, but we don't want to talk about it too much because then we don't want other people to find out, uh, the name of the band will be Alger Hiss and the Rosenbergs. I think that that's just a really good name. Uh, I came up with that a couple of years ago and, and I don't tell many people about it because I'm worried, but I'm working on the trademark on it. Uh, and if anybody ever, uh, if anybody ever wants to start a band, I've got a great name for them. I'll sell it to them. Uh, or I would also uh, do it if I ever started a band. So uh, that would be my name, Alger Hiss and the Rosenbergs. Um, yeah. Okay. Now on to uh, number, I guess not a number, politics at home. Uh, a very interesting story that uh, almost, I think most of you know about already because you've already seen the pictures. Um so uh, what ends up happening in 1948? Uh, in 1948, the Republicans end up picking uh, picking a guy to run against Harry Truman. Harry Truman's the Democrat, uh, FDR's successor. Uh, so they pick a guy named Thomas Dewey. Thomas Dewey. Uh, Thomas Dewey, uh, I believe, was a governor. I want to say of New York at that point. Um, I'm not sure on that, so don't quote me on that. But he's uh, he's a Republican, and so he runs against Truman. Uh, this is a very, very close, uh, very close election. Um, they end up uh, being neck and neck. Uh, there was questions on whether or not uh, the uh, American war hero Dwight D. Eisenhower uh, would run or not. Uh, he decided not to run. Uh, and so Eisenhower ends up running four years later as a Republican and wins uh, wins as two term uh, two term president in uh, 1952. However, uh, this is a close election between Thomas Dewey and Harry Truman. Uh, the story goes is that uh, the election came down to the final night and nobody was sure how certain states were going to vote. Uh, nobody knew exactly what was going to happen as the returns came in. Uh, but as you uh, as you probably know, uh, newspapers, which was the primary news media at that point, uh, they have to make a decision at some point 
uh, what they're going to put in their newspaper or not. Uh, they have to print their newspapers and write everything up. So uh, that ultimately leads to them having a deadline. The problem was at this point, uh, every newspaper in America, the, the election went late into the night and the first thing in the morning people are going to want to read on these newspapers is who won the election. So they essentially had to take a guess based on what they, uh, what they knew from the returns that were in at that point. So uh, some newspapers thought Truman was going to win. Uh, so they printed up headlines saying Truman wins. Uh, some newspapers thought uh, Dewey was going to win. Uh, so they printed up headlines saying Dewey's going to win uh, or Dewey won. Uh, and then come to find out uh, Harry Truman ends up pulling the election off uh, and winning. So you end up with a headline that is pictured in that picture uh, that is Harry Truman holding a newspaper from the Chicago Daily Tribune uh, saying Dewey defeats Truman uh, because the Chicago Tribune had picked, had picked Dewey and thought Dewey was going to win and he did not. But they had printed the newspapers and published them anyways. So there he is and he's very happy about it because he uh, just won. Uh, and so I have that picture hanging in my room on my chalkboard over on the side. Uh, so you've probably seen it before. Um, so that's a, a famous photo and a famous story all to itself. So with Harry Truman uh, being president for four more years, uh, he ends up advocating for uh, what is called the fair deal, Truman's fair deal. We have talked about uh, the New Deal. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt had a square deal. Uh, this is a fair deal. Okay, everybody's got their own little catchphrase that they want to have in here. Uh, he proposed this thing in 1949, so right in the first year of his second term. Um, he calls for a bunch of stuff, so I'm just going to kind of list it off. Uh, calls for improved housing, calls for uh, higher employment, so full employment up to like 2 or 3% unemployment, uh, higher minimum wage, as well as farm price supports, trying to help out farmers, uh, those most uh, vulnerable people in society or vulnerable producers, uh, as well as uh, benefits to uh, workers like in the TVA. Uh, he wanted the Tennessee Valley Authority, multiple new example, multiple new, uh, I guess, rollouts of the Tennessee Valley Authority, and also Social Security extension or expansion. So wanted Social Security to grow as well. Uh, Congress only passes a couple parts of this, uh, a couple parts of this fair deal. Uh, they raise the minimum wage, that they do. Uh, so they raise the minimum wage. They end up uh, create uh, a program to give public housing to people. Uh, the Housing Act of 1949, Housing Act of 1949. Uh, as well as the last thing here is old age insurance, which would be Social Security. So an extension, an extension of that to cover more people, uh, more beneficiaries in Social Security. Uh, in 1950. So uh, it doesn't accomplish everything that he wants to accomplish. Uh, he kind of gets pulled into a global conflict uh, in the Korean War, right? I guess a semi-global conflict, uh, but gets pulled into the Korean War. Uh, and then that kind of occupies his attention going forward. Now, uh, let's talk about the Korean War, then we'll be done. So the Korean conflict, uh, we have a three to four year war that breaks out. Uh, that is, uh, not a lot happens in it. Uh, I mean, a lot happens, but not a lot comes of it. Uh, so I'll kind of build into this. So Japan had taken over Korea after World War, or during World War II. Uh, when Japan collapses, Korea is split up into two parts. Uh, the Soviet Union controls the northern part. Uh, the Americans control the southern part. So there is a line that is kind of drawn in the sand here. Uh, right across the middle of Korea uh, at the 38th parallel. Uh, and this is hopefully ringing bells from global history, uh, AP World and whatnot. So each country ends up setting up their own government uh, and setting up, uh, in North Korea, they set up a communist government. In South Korea, they set up a democratic government. So uh, in 1950, okay, five years go by. In 1950, uh, North Korea ultimately decides that they want to invade South Korea. Uh, take it over. They want to take over the whole Korean Peninsula, uh, just make it all uh, all um, socialist, uh, communist, right? So 
uh, what America does, because we view this as an issue, obviously. Uh, we view this as uh, containment or an opportunity to practice containment uh, under that Truman Doctrine. Uh, we decide that we are going to order a military buildup. Harry Truman orders um, soldiers to go to Korea uh, under the United Nations. It was technically a United Nations action, uh, but we end up providing almost all the troops to this. Uh, but we send a large number of troops uh, to uh, Korea to help fight this. Uh, we end up being the leaders here. Uh, we go, we send over George or George MacArthur, or, or yeah, George MacArthur, I think, yeah. Uh, Douglas, Douglas MacArthur, George MacArthur is a different guy. I knew that was weird. Uh, Douglas MacArthur, we send over there. Uh, and so he's the UN commander at this point. Uh, and we have a majority of the troops over there in Korea, and we provide most of the resources. And our goal is to push, uh, push the uh, Koreans, uh, the North Koreans, back up into uh, North Korea, as it shows in the second map. <coughs> so we had gotten uh, almost pushed completely off of the peninsula, or the South Koreans did. Uh, but then we ended up uh, invading uh, over on the side here uh, at, uh, Seoul, or at Seoul or Incheon, uh, near Seoul, which is the capital of Korea. Uh, so we invade and then uh, pinch the North Koreans uh, and push them back up into North Korea. And we get very, very close uh, we get very close. We push way past the 38th parallel. We get very close to wiping wiping North Korea off the map. Uh, but then uh, we get uh, somebody else jumping into this war, and it would be China. Uh, that that worst uh, worst case scenario that we thought might happen with China becoming communist and then China being our opponent in this, um, it happens here. So China jumps in. China uh, throws a tons of uh, tons of volunteers volunteers. Uh, they were probably forced to do so. Um, thousands of volunteers uh, into uh, the U or into the North Korea territory and uh, pushes the UN back to uh, the 38th parallel. So uh, things kind of stop uh, back here at the 38th parallel, close close to where they were beforehand. Uh, that ends up kind of being where they leave off. Uh, they get set there. Um, I mean, by the middle or by the uh, by November, yeah, uh, no, not by November. By the end of uh, 1950, early 1951, we are back at this uh, back at this middle ground. And then for two years, we just keep fighting, and nothing actually moves. Uh, so we get to that uh, ceasefire line, and we don't ultimately move. Now, Douglas MacArthur uh, had some issues with Harry Truman at this time. Uh, Douglas MacArthur was kind of disobeying what Truman wanted him to do. Uh, in some cases, disagreed with uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, MacArthur wanted uh, wanted more soldiers brought over, and the Joint Chiefs didn't want that. Um, so what ends up happening is uh, Harry Truman kicks him out of, uh, kicks him out of power. Uh, so he removes MacArthur from control, from command, uh, in April of 1951. So MacArthur is uh, no longer in control of this Korean War. And it's kind of his last moment there as, as MacArthur is uh, kind of fading into the shadows as a military leader. Um, so uh, I think that's all I've got for you. Uh, I think we wrapped everything up there. Um, <clears throat> again, if people have uh, questions or comments or concerns or, I don't know, fact-checking, if you have something like that, uh, let me know. Um, email me, send me a message, whatever. Um, uh, tomorrow, we will do something else. It will not be, uh, will not be notes. Uh, so we'll do something regarding, uh, we'll do something regarding chapter 35 tomorrow. I've not quite picked that out yet. So I'll get there. Uh, we will do that tomorrow and uh, we will uh, make it happen then. So uh, I think that's all. Uh, I have a short message from my sponsors. Stay tuned for that. Uh, otherwise, I will let you go and see you tomorrow. Stay safe.